Hi, everyone. I'm David. Uh, I'm going to be running Blaster Master for you. And uh, on the couch with me... Uh, I'm Scavenger. You're Adam Anchor. All right. You might not recognize the title screen. Uh, that's because we're running the Japanese version. Uh, so, we ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. So, time starts when we gain control of the tank. That's going to be about 10 seconds after I push start. So, here we go. Ready? Go. All right, so the uh, first uh, difference in the Japanese version, you already saw the intro screen looks a little bit different. Um, you aren't going to see a huge amount of differences in the uh, Japanese version uh, until you get to Area 3. Um, so we'll discuss those when he gets there. But uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this game, it's uh, an early example of uh, what's been termed a Metroidvania since then. Exploration, uh, getting power-ups to open up new places. Um, Japanese version has a few different uh, uh, glitches that are specific to it, so that's why it's faster. Uh, it's not as fast as the European version, but the European version you basically glitch through the entire game and go straight to the end. Um, so this is a little bit more of a, a little bit more of an interesting category. Yeah. There's actually enough differences between the U.S. and Japanese versions for them to be separate categories. Yeah, there's a, at least a couple of glitches that just straight don't, don't work in the U.S. version for whatever reason, so we can still consider them separate categories. But most of the runs happen on the Japanese version these days. Yeah, it's actually a little bit faster due to imp lag implications and it, as well as everything else that they just listed. Also allows for infinite continues, which is uh, kind of important later in the run because it lets us skip some backtracking by resetting the game to restart it on the first screen of the game and skip having to go back there. So he picked up a couple of uh, missile power-ups from those enemies, and he's going to be using those in later stages to uh, kill enemies really fast. So one of the things about this game um, Enemy types have a fixed enemy drop type, so those skulls that he just killed, for example, will always drop missile power-ups. Um, the most common power-ups are health or hover, and he's going to be, later on, he's going to be hoping for some fast hover drops, but uh, it's one of, the, one of the fastest ways to end up having to reset your run is if you get a bad hover farm in a couple of spots. But. Yeah, it, it could be a major, major time swing, depending on how generous the game wants to be. Yeah. Another thing I don't think we've mentioned yet, uh, he's pausing as he's going through screen transitions. The, the main reason for that is it just simply skips the screen transition animation. It saves a little bit under a second, or a, about a third of a second every one of them, I want to say. Yeah, it adds up over the course of a run. Um. So that boss he killed a little while ago, he ended up getting a, he got a power-up called the Hyper, which not only increases the damage of your shots, but that uh, green gate guard, you can't kill that thing unless you have Hyper. Um, he actually ended up killing it with the missiles, because the missiles are somewhat, do so much more damage, but the missiles won't do damage until you have Hyper. Uh, here in Area 2, he's mostly just trying to move as quickly as he can while uh, strategically taking out enemies to reduce lag along the way. This game can get notorious lag, notoriously laggy if there's any more than one or two enemies on the screen. And uh, the game ends up just becoming a, an act of trying to keep your momentum while dispatching as many enemies off the screen as you can as soon as they come onto the screen. Yeah. So these gray caterpillars that he's killing here, um, you can't actually shoot them if you're level with them, so you have to shoot them on the way up. They're too short to shoot if you're on the same floor that they are. Uh, same with those mines. So um, it doesn't end up being a problem too often if you're accurate with your shots. But there's a couple of places where uh, you end up having to jump over them instead of shooting them. Yeah, they're intended to jump out of your tank and take them on outside of the tank, but that's just way too slow for a speed run. Yeah. We, we don't have time to get out. Nope. Got it. Got to go fast. So 
So one thing you're not going to see in a speed run of this game ever is that there's a lot of extra uh, overhead sections that you can go to and get power-ups, but um, we don't need any of those, so we never go into any of them um, in this run. Oops. A couple of the uh, later sequels of this game did have reasons for you to go into uh, some of the side areas other than just getting temporary power-ups, but we're not playing those. So. Yeah, most notably the recent remake of this for Switch, which actually just got a PC port. Um, that, that actually puts an item in pretty much every side dungeon. Yeah, even if it's just a map. And a boss for that matter, too. There's a yeah. lot of new content to that game. Yeah, if you haven't picked up Blaster Master Zero on Steam, um, came out, I don't know, like a month ago? A yeah, month it sounds ago. about right. So, yeah, so Blaster Master Zero also has DLC characters. So if you like Shantae or Shovel Knight, you know, pick it up. Yeah. So he just did a glitch that uh, it works on both versions, but um, some of the bosses in this game, if you pause while a grenade is hitting them, they will continue to take damage while, while paused. And then uh, you just wait for like five seconds, 10 seconds, something like that. Um, and then unpause it and they'll be dead. For some odd reason, it works on every boss that doesn't really have a, or it works on every boss that has a palette swapped version of it. Yeah. So there's two bosses that you'll see twice in the run. Both of uh, the iterations of both of those bosses it'll work on. Yeah. Uh, one of those we're going to be skipping later. Uh, we're only gonna see one of the two frogs in this game. Well, well, two, this, two this of the too. two of the three yeah. three frogs. Although one of those frogs isn't the boss. So, yeah, the U.S. version very famously has a uh, pretty hokey story about a boy saving his frog after he, for no reason, jumps down a random giant hole in his backyard, which has a giant chest on it that says radioactive. Yeah, because yeah, he's kind of an irresponsible pet owner who uh, left a box of plutonium in his backyard and then took a tank for a joyride. Yeah. Um, in the so, Japanese version, it's a much more uh, anime-ish mecha plot. It's like, you know, genius boy pilot out to save some planet save from... Humanity. Uh, out to save a planet from some alien invasion. Yeah, the, the Switch game that we were talking about, they actually kind of fused the two stories together to make a pretty coherent story, actually. Yep. Yeah, so actually I was right the first time because you don't see the frog in the Japanese version, so it is only one out of two frogs. Yeah. So that room is actually pretty difficult to uh, get the timing on that right, because if you shoot too early, the missiles will miss the kettles, as I like to call them. And if you shoot too late, then they spew bombs all over the place, which you either have to dodge or wait for them to go away, and they lag the game up really bad, and it can turn into a huge mess. But that was a really nice run through of that run. Yeah, yeah. If they end up hitting you, they just do so much damage and they can stun lock you. It's, it's easy to lose three quarters of your life meter just from one bad kettle dropper. Yeah. Yeah, Area 3 in general just represents a huge step up in difficulty from Areas 1 and 2. Yeah. The game kind of eases you into it, but then it throws a whole lot at you here. Yeah, I think one, one thing uh, about this game is that if, you, if you're able to take your time, it tends to be a lot easier, but if you're trying to rush into things, you know, which obviously you're trying to do in a speed run. <laughs> Gotta go fast! Yep. These turrets are totally random when they want to shoot at you, and if they decide to shoot, they just lag the game up. Yep. There's a couple of different categories where you actually want to kill some of those to try to get hover drops, um, but in the in the resets run, um, you lose all your hover either when you continue or when you reset, so you don't there's a, you don't farm the turrets for hover ever. Yeah, you just have to get it right back after your reset warp, anyways. Yeah. So coming up in this next dungeon, in every other category, except maybe Warpless, I guess, we uh, take an intentional death in this dungeon to kind of set up a, uh, a game over warp and also to make the boss a little bit easier and give us some safety health. Uh, 
when you're trying to get like a top level time in this game, you tend to generally skip that death abuse in this category, which can make that boss just absolutely insane. You can get there with as little as one bar of health, and it's just a really stressful fight at that low of life. Yeah, if, if you do it perfectly, you won't take any damage, but it's one of those fights that's pretty easy to uh, get slightly wrong. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, three, three bars of health is uh, an okay amount for the fight. Yeah. Now these squares will always spawn in the exact same positions every time. It's a, it's a very fixed fight. So the way they can move after they spawn can deviate yeah, sometimes, that was, but that, that was, was just perfect. Not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we got another difference in the uh, Japanese version. As I said earlier, we're going to be reset warping. Yeah. Uh, so uh, hi, I'm David. I'm going to be running Blaster Master for you on the couch with me. <laughs> uh, I'm Scavenger Two One Six. Uranium Anchor. <laughs> So for whatever reason, in the Japanese version, when you soft reset, you keep all your power-ups. Um, it might just been something they forgot to implement, because it does, definitely doesn't work that way in the US version. Um, but so he's back at the beginning of the game, and he still has hover. But unfortunately, he has empty hover, so he needs to get a good wow. farm here. Wow. That's good. OK. All right, now we're so, going to take a death to, to save a little bit of time backtracking to the beginning of the screen. Yeah. For those of you wondering, I would absolutely kill to have a hover farm that good in a world record attempt. Oh, man. That was, that was really good. That was amazing. It's way better than what's in my PB. So coming up is area four. Um, don't, don't, don't like this music too long, because you're not going to hear it too long. Um, it's we're going to be skipping the best, a lot some of the it. best music in the game. Yeah, it's, it's all right. I don't. Know, I don't. I think the only the only song in this game that I don't like is Area Eight, just because I don't think the NES hardware does atmospheric music very well. No. I can see what they were going for, but it just I don't know. Didn't work. Good door like map. Yeah. So he, he, what he did there was if Jason is facing the other direction while momentum carries you through a doorway, it'll actually push you through the doorway the wrong way and slightly offset your position. So he's going to do that three more times here because every time he does it, he's going to offset his position by one tile. And then he can get underneath this barrier and then he can pause it and reset his position and continue on through the rest of the level without having to bring the tank in here. Yeah, and the um, tank sinks painfully slow, so it's so much faster to just swim down as Jason. But normally you wouldn't be able to do that without bringing the tank and destroying those crusher blocks there. Yeah, so if you couldn't do that, what you'd end up having to do is uh, burn another continue, although in the Japanese version that wouldn't matter as much, although it would just take longer, um, and just get the tank down there and blow those up. But since you can do that, then it's faster. And that particular glitch uh, also works the same way in the US version. So he's going to be trying to conserve as much health as he can through uh, most of this. Um, except to right up at the very end, he's going to want to take a deliberate death um, to save time because uh, you don't want to reset after you beat this stage. Uh, you want to use a regular continue and end up back there at area five. And there's no quick way to die. So you want to have as little health as possible coming in here so that you can just kill yourself on an enemy. Um, so after he beats this boss, he'll he'll do that again, and then he'll end up back at uh, beginning of area five without having to swim all the way back to the beginning. On the subject of this boss, this is another difference in the Japanese version. Um, the U.S. game is possible to glitch this boss, and because of the way that NES handles large boss enemies, it can't draw a large sprite object, so it handles them as a large animated background layer. And you you trick the game into spawning the boss into the previous hallway. And it essentially becomes part of the background and is just a sitting duck. Yep. The US version is a frame perfect trick. Nice. All right, so we got it. You'll see the boss is just a weird blinking Game Boy stuck in the wall. Yeah. I don't so, want to fight a crab, I want to fight a Game Boy. Yeah. So this, this glitch is a lot easier to do in the Japanese version. The timing is just way less uh, precise. But you can do that in the US version if you get a frame perfect yeah. uh, room, if you leave the room on the exact right frame. It's frame perfect in the US game. It's 
uh, eight frames than the Japanese game. Yeah, but it's also more forgiving because you can pause it repeatedly. Yeah. So it's uh, even if you if you're paranoid enough about it, you can just pause repeatedly until you see the glitch happen and then, and then step out of the room as soon as you see it. Yep. So as you see, he didn't have to swim back through Area 5. Now he's in Area 6, the uh, re uh, requisite ice level. And another another little change from the US to the Japanese version, the uh, ice physics only are about half as strong in the Japanese version. Yeah. It only really affects your acceleration about, I'd, I'd say it takes about twice as long in the US version to ramp up to full speed. Yeah, you still want to you still want to do most of your acceleration in the air, but uh, it does make it easier to control if you don't want to jump for some reason. Yeah, it's more of just a general gameplay difference than a speed run pertinent thing. Yeah, and other than that, this section is entirely identical to the U.S. version. Oh yeah. Until we kill the boss. Yep. This is one of the better pieces of music in the game, in my opinion. Yeah, some of the platforming in this room and the next one is can be a little bit scary. Uh, if you fall, then it's a long way down, and you'll have to take an intentional death abuse if you don't want to lose too much more time. By the way, leap of faith. Nice. Nice. So if you miss that jump, you lose about 40 seconds or so just instantly. Yeah, I know that pain far too well. I, for some reason, that jump gets me way more often than it should. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a hard jump, but you just end up getting pretty lazy with it after you do it so many times, and you take it for granted, and then you just miss it and lose a really good run. Yeah. More of these uh, caterpillars from earlier. He's going to attempt to take out most of them with missiles as they're dropping off the ceiling. Okay. Yeah, that went pretty well. It's like the one place in the entire run where you use homing missiles. Well, actually, no, there's, well, yeah, okay, yeah, in this particular category, it's like the only place you use homing missiles. Really good area six, though. It yeah. was really clean. And so these destroyable blocks, if you pause and unpause the game after you destroy some of them, they'll come right back on the screen. Yep. I think that's the only place in the run where you where we do that particular trick, but... Yeah, I can't think of anywhere else it would be particularly useful unless you, like, botch going through Area 7. Yeah. But none of the categories would even go through Area 7 anymore, so... Well, that's not strictly true, but the ones that the ones that people play anymore, for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. If you're doing U.S. Warpless, you still need to go through Area Seven. So we're going to see our second version of Crabulous here. Uh, another boss that falls to the pause glitch. Have to be a little more careful about it, though. Uh, okay. Frozen Crabulous is prone to lagging, and if you lag too much, then he can kind of become a zombie. Yeah, it's a lot of it's. It can waste a lot of time. It can even kill you afterwards. So, but time to reset again. So, hi, I'm David. I'm running Blaster Master, and on the couch with me, I'm Scavenger, Uranium Anchor. <laughs> Uh, so now we're heading towards Area 7, and while we're backtracking, this is the part of the run that has seen the most changes over the past, I'd say, four or five years? Yeah, we there were a lot of discoveries made after uh, the four-way race we had back in AGDQ 2016. Uh, some of them we discovered before AGDQ 2017, but uh, they weren't applicable yeah. to the category that was in that... in that... Uh, uh, in that event, so you didn't get to see most of them. Um, well, I'm trying to remember exactly when the uh, the new route through Area 7 was discovered, but uh, we never got to show off the uh, we never got to show off the second version of the Area yeah. 7 glitch. Like if you if you saw the race in 2016, Scavenger was the only person crazy enough to try the shortcut through Area 7 because back then it was frame perfect, and if you messed it up, yeah. you soft blocked. 
game just uh, crashes out, right? Yeah, he soft locked in a way that you couldn't recover from, like, even a little bit. Um, but uh, somebody discovered a safer version, a safer and faster version of the skip um, that, uh, wor that worked both in uh, uh, Japanese and U.S. version. But you're not going to see that one either because somebody then dis later discovered an even safer and faster version that only works in the Japanese version. Yep, so you don't get to see any cool screen wraps or out-of-bound trickery, just... Yeah. Awesome little bit of ice skating, we'll say. Yeah, and I'm I'm perfectly fine with that because that that trick was so finicky and so easy to mess up. Oh yeah, that that was a scary trick. Yeah, like, the trick coming up in Area Seven is pretty tricky. Probably easier than the old skips, but it's still very precise and probably yeah. a reset point. Yeah, if you were doing like an actual record attempt, you would reset as soon as you messed that up. But um, for a marathon, it's actually relatively safe. Yeah, if you miss it, you can try it again, and it really only costs you about 12 to 15 seconds per attempt. So on that note, I do use an audio cue for it, so moment of silence, please. Uh. Got it! So he basically just skipped all of Area 7. Uh, for whatever reason, we're not quite sure why that only works on the Japanese version, but he has to pause it. I'll, I'll wait for until he kills his boss. That sounds lovely. Yeah. Now there's no frogs in this game. Yep. But there's still one on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> So normally, um, stepping over this liquid kills you instantly, but if you've got invincibility running, you can step over it. Um, for some reason, only in the Japanese version, you can pause it while you're still in the hitbox of the robot. And when you unpause it, it'll reset your invincibility timer, which gives you just enough time to run over the lava and get all the way over to the boss. For whatever reason, that doesn't work in the US version. There's a different um, lava skip trick you can do there, but it does require going through most of the stage. Um, but yeah, you didn't get to see, you didn't get to hear the best music in the game for more than like, I don't know, 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think we heard a full loop of it. No. It's a shame. You'll get to hear it for final boss. Yeah. That's true. Probably for longer than you heard it there. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, now he's on his way to area eight. Um, the last power-up in the game lets you uh, drive the tank on ceilings as well as walls. Unfortunately, it also messes up the way, it also changes the way that the uh, driving off corners works. Um, and it makes it a lot more, um, makes it pretty easy to drive down off the wall instead of uh, jumping. There's a couple of different ways you can uh, mitigate that. And one of them is, um, what you see he just did there. If you jump and then land on the corner and you let the momentum carry you, as long as you're not actually pressing a direction, the tank won't drive off the corner. Ooh. So, so that's actually, uh, that drop is actually going to be fairly helpful. Um, kind of. I mean, I could use it in area eight for safety, but it's only like a three in 10 chance of it dropping here. So normally you go through area eight without any hover at all. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to burn it here and show off what area eight looks like without hover. Okay. <laughs> well, all right then. Which means he's going to have to go through a very nasty room having to, to fight uh, Wall 2 and actually pull off what should be a simple jump if Wall 2 didn't just completely break the control in this game. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, just it's still not an easy room even without Wall 2, but it, Wall 2 certainly makes it way harder than it, sh than it would be yeah, without it. For sure. Yeah, this is one of the best controlling games on the NES until you get wall two, then you'll want to throw your controller against the wall. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first room that wall two actually makes difficult, and this is the second one. Yeah, when you get to each of these corners, those spikes do a lot of damage. And for some reason, wall two, holding a horizontal direction at a corner, whew, riding down the wall overrides any jump input. Yeah, so, so you cannot jump. For, uh, that was perfect. He, he, that, he did a really good job in there. That deserves a clap. <laughs> he didn't do any of the safety strats. He just went straight through and just get, did it yeah. perfect. 
And he has enough health that he probably doesn't need to worry here. Yeah, he'll be fine. Coming up to the final dungeon. A little bit of block mashing, and uh, then we'll be to the Plutonium boss, the first of our two final bosses. Also, the enemy on the cover of the US game. Yep. So he's going to do a, a variant of the pause trick here. The um, As you can see, every time he pauses, the uh, the face disappears, but it still ticks the, the boss's invincibility frames down. So he can spam pause and grenade and uh, and oh okay good there we didn't go. does, it didn't zombie too bad um, so that that doesn't really make it faster but it does make it a lot safer because the boss has a lot less room to maneuver so he's gonna try to get the boss into uh, into the corner here and just mash the mash grenade and hopefully kill it without too much difficulty yeah if you're standing a specific distance from the wall the boss really can't whip you. If he tries whipping straight down, it'll miss you, and if he whips diagonal, it'll go over your head. So time's gonna be on fade out after the boss starts exploding. Yeah. We'll... And... Time! <laughs> wow, sub 26? What? Nice. That was a really good run. That's insane. So my Isn't PB... that a second off your PB? Yeah, my PB is 25.55. <laughs> Insane. I think I, I think that might be the best Blaster Master room we've ever had at a GT game. <laughs> so very nice. Yeah. Oh, and I totally forgot to mention, uh, David is actually the first person who ever submitted a Blaster Master run to SDA back in like 2006. So we've come full circle. Yeah, it's, it's uh, crazy to see that one of the original runners of this game is just now getting to run it on the GDQ stage. It's awesome. Yep. And it's an awesome first time here. Uh, that was about as good a run as I could have hoped for. Yeah, that was. I'd, I'd, be, I'd kill to have a run that good. <laughs> Better than my PB. All right, so I want to go ahead and thank uh, Uranium Anchor and Scavenger for joining me on the couch here. It was a lot easier to do this one with them, taking care of all of the commentary. And uh, I also want to thank the GD GDQ staff for running this event and accepting this game for me. And then I also want to thank my wife, who uh, has no idea why I do this, but she supports me anyways. And she she's the reason I try my hardest to be the best person I can be every day. So very thanks. Well, thank you, David, for that amazing Blaster Master run. Coming up, we have Solomon's Key from Metroid McFly. But uh, we do have some incentives coming up later uh, today, by which I mean this morning, that we have not met yet, including upgrading Ranger X from easy difficulty to heavy difficulty. So we have a little ways to go on that. We only have $570, we need 3,000. So if you want to see that game get a lot harder and a lot more exciting, think about chipping in for that one. I have a donation here from NME for $25. It says, go get them, David. Good luck with this top five SGDQ run. Everybody who's watching knows that he killed it. And I have another donation here from Nemo2342 for $25. Staying up late with all my speed friends to cast, catch this awesome Blaster Master run. Thanks to all the runners, commentators, and staff for putting on such a great event.
I have a $25 donation from the speaker that says, hey David, what's better than wall two? Everything? I couldn't agree more. Here's $25 to put where you wish. Good luck on your run, no stress. You've got it, no resets. Have a donation here for $25 from Christopher that says, Blaster Master is amazing, so I had to donate. Put this donation towards Prey Glitch Showcase, one of my most favorite games. P.S. Donation Reader is awesome. Aw. Thank you, Christopher. Another donation for $25 from Manzome Bromide. Loving the first day lineup and the NES block this SGDQ. Best of luck to Metroid McFly for his Solomon's Key and Metroid runs. Those are coming up next. Here's hoping for a merciful room 30. Donation is split between the two glitch exhibitions because after we go fast, we have a solemn obligation to break everything. We do have another incentive coming up later this morning that could use a little help. Two things for Half Minute Hero. Um, if you donate towards another goddess, you'll be unlocking an extra quest. And if you donate towards Hero 3, oh my gosh, if you thought 30 seconds was too long, this one's for you. Hero 3 mode gives the player three seconds instead of 30, meaning we'll have to be extra fast. Yeah, donate for that one for uh, Sonic's birthday. Still counts, right? Still counts. I have $25 here from Designation 15. This is what I love the most about GDQ. Niche games being completed in awesome ways. Keep it up, speedrunners and GDQ staff. Hashtag late night crew hype. I have $10 here from Slusk, who says, my boss gave me time off just so I could watch Metroid McFly's runs. Happy me.
I have $50 here from Bass Beast that says, so proud of my man, Metroid McFly, making it to the big stage with Solomon's Key. For those who don't know, Metroid McFly is the living task and earn <laughs> ever up to jump you're watching. All the best and my shout out will not be denied. It was not, here, here it is. Congrats to the whole GDQ crew, MSF, and everyone involved. Keep up the great work, McFly. I have a donation here for $25 from Connor O'Brien. Thank you to all the runners. Even bigger thank you to the people who put in their time to organize this wonderful event. It's inspiring to see what people can put together. And with that, I think we are ready for Metroid.